come again. I'm Fabio Chiusi. I'm a freelance journalist and a researcher. And um, I welcome you to this panel. We're talking about algorithmic accountability. Uh, it's a pretty serious issue, especially for a Saturday morning, but it's, I think it's, I hope we'll wake you up. Anyway, um, we have, we're here with Julia Anguin, a former ProPublica journalist. Now she's venturing into new, a new outlet, and I'm pretty curious to hear whether she has something to say about this. I'm very curious and interested. And she, she made a lot of efforts to investigate this topic in the last couple of years or more, and especially in the last years. And um, I myself, I'm a big fan of her work, so I'm proud to be here and with her, even if she's on Skype on my back and I can't really see her, but hi, Julia. And um, um, she, I think she's gonna start by making a, a short presentation just to give a flavor of what her work was about. And the main topic being, you know, we always, we, for a long time at least, we, we thought that algorithms were objective and neutral and they didn't embed any values in them and didn't embed any ethics, any metaphysics, or any politics, for what matter. And uh, we found uh, out, <coughs> especially thanks to work like that of Julia and his colleagues, that this is not the case, absolutely not the case, that uh, algorithms can be discriminating and can be doing it in a, way, in a hidden way, in an automatic way, which is very difficult to recognize, spot, and to hold into account. And there is a very nice book that I suggest you to read uh, by Cathy O'Neill called uh, Ma uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. And that's, that's actually what they are in, in some cases. They, these mathematical models, they're weapons of math destruction. I like the, the definition. But I will hand it to Julia. And Julia, just shut, uh, start your presentation and then we can have a quick talk. Hi, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, so tell me if this doesn't work, if the Skype is wor not working, but I'm going to start. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work that my colleague Jeff Larson, who's in the room, I think, and myself have done on holding algorithms accountable. Um, I'm going to just do a short presentation here. Um, let me know if you can see this. Um, do you see the yes. presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to talk briefly about myself. I um, just to get a sense of a background. So this is me. I'm um, a journalist, but I've always um, I grew up in the technology industry. I grew up in Palo Alto. Um, this was my first computer when I was in fifth grade. I learned to program, and I really thought that I was going to go into um, the technology industry, where parents both worked in Silicon Valley. Um, but I, I fell in love with newspapers, and so I went and joined the Wall Street Journal in 2000. I spent 13 years there, and then I joined ProPublica in 2014. And for the past few years, um, I've been working on this series there, investor, uh, Machine Bias, Investigating Algorithmic Injustice. And this is largely with um, my colleague Jeff, who's in the room, and a, and a bunch of other people. And I'm going to just walk you through two of the um, investigations we did, just so you have a sense of what does it mean to investigate an algorithm. So the first one we did was um, an algorithm that predicts the risk of recidivism. So recidivism is a word, I don't know if it translates in, in all languages, but basically uh, whether you're gonna go on, whether you're likely to commit a crime in the future. And so in the US, the software that we looked at called Compass is one of many different software programs used throughout the criminal justice system to determine whether you're likely to commit a future crime. And what happens is you, um, the judge might use your score as a way to include that in whether you should be able to get out of jail or whether your sentence should be longer. Um, because in addition to looking at the crime you committed, they look at whether you're likely to be a risk to society in the future. So we wanted to know whether this was a fair 
algorithm or whether it was biased. Um, so what we did was we went and um, filed a FOIA uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, request in Florida in 2015 for all the people who had been scored by this algorithm um, over a two-year period. And we received the data um, in September of 2015. And we had to fight, um, we had to hire a lawyer to fight, um, but we did get the data because it's um, public records, criminal justice records in the U.S. are, are public. And so um, we had a good case for getting those scores. And when we first received them, the very first thing we did was we put them in um, these bar charts just to see um, whether there was any bias, you know, just what does it look like? So um, as you can see, um, the black defendant scores were um, evenly distributed, one through 10, meaning one is the lowest risk, 10 is the highest risk. And you can see that um, black defendants had gotten kind of evenly um, all of those different scores. But when we looked at the white defendant scores, we noticed that they were heavily clustered um, among the low risk, right? And so we were surprised and we wondered whether um, that might be some bias. But the problem is just looking at these scores alone like this doesn't tell you if it's biased because it's possible that all of these low risk people, all of the white defendants were really actually very low risk. You know, they were all Mother Teresa, they had never committed a crime, you know, who knows? So what we had to do was we had to look up all of their criminal records. So we spent the next six months um, very sadly looking up um, everybody's records. So we had 18,000 people. So we used automated techniques to go look a, on this website for their criminal histories. And um, then we also looked for whether they had gone on to commit any crimes after the score um, they were given so we could see whether the prediction was correct. And so after we did that, we were able to do a logistic regression and show that um, when you had a white and a black uh, defendant who had the same kind of criminal history, the same age, gender, um, and future recidivism, meaning whether or not they'd gone on to commit a future crime, black defendants were 45% more likely to be assigned higher risk scores than white defendants. So then we could say at that point that this algorithm was biased against black defendants. And what um, that looks like on, on, in a way that's sort of easier to understand is the difference in error rates. So basically when, um, when the algorithm would, the algorithm was actually correct about 60% of the time but 40% of the time it was incorrect. And that 40% of the time that it was incorrect, when it was wrong, when it, when it said that you're, um, for an African American, that they were high risk but didn't reoffend, it would be twice as likely to give an African American an unfair high risk score than a white defendant. And similarly, they'd be twice as likely to, for a white defendant to get an unfair low risk score compared to an African-American. So the error rates were uh, biased in different ways. And it's a complicated story to tell, but it is something that matters on the ground. It matters to the people who get those scores, right? So here's an example. Um, these are the two people we focused on in our article. So Vernon Prater came in um, for petty theft, was arrested, and he got a low risk score of three. Prisha Borden came in um, for petty theft and she got a high risk score of eight. But if you look at the details of their life, you can see that Vernon had a huge amount of prior offenses. He had two armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery. Um, and he went on after being scored to get uh, actually a Ted prison sentence for grand theft. Similarly, but, but so his risks are wrong. The low risk of three was um, incorrect. 
similarly, Brisha Borden claimed in her petty theft, but she had forged the criminal misdemeanors, and she did not go on to commit any future crimes. So her high risk score was incorrect the other way. She was given a high risk score, but it didn't seem to be correct. And so that is what we call a false positive and a false negative. So the false negative is Vernon was a false negative, meaning he was viewed as a negative, low risk, but he wasn't. Risha was viewed as high risk. And that pattern was not just them, right? It was throughout the data. So that was um, one algorithmic investigation. Another one was we did uh, the risk of car accidents out the insurance companies use to determine what price to pay your insurance. So we, it's been long known in the United States that insurance prices are high in my neighborhoods and other neighborhoods for the same safe driver, but nobody could ever say why that was the case. The insurance company said it was because the neighborhoods were riskier. So we wanted to test that assumption. So we went and got um, a huge data set of $3 million um, insurance quotes by the zip code. And this was something that Consumer Reports, a day they bought for us, it cost $100,000. So um, that was really great that they bought that for us. Um, and then we did public record requests in 50 states for how much insurance companies had to pay and claim per zip code. That's the true measure of what for them, meaning how much did they have to give out um, for accidents? We found, um, and then we compared premiums to payouts for a single safe driver. So basically, on this chart, one side here on the left, the x axis, is um, the actual payouts and the y axis is the predicted payouts. I mean, premium is what they thought of it would be. So, you can see the white, the red line is the minority drivers. It actually tracks the risk pretty straight. White driver, white neighborhoods, they don't track with risk. Right? So, as the risk increases towards the right hand of the graph, it actually the price that they pay goes down. And so this was sort of an unexplainable difference for neighborhoods with the same risk. If it was a whiter neighborhood, they were actually paying less than what you think the risk would require. Um, and what that looks like in real life, somebody like Otis, this is a guy in Chicago, he's paying $190 a month for his car insurance, even though he had had no accidents. And then his this guy across town in the whiter neighborhood of Chicago, Ryan, paying $55 a month for his insurance through a guy, even though his spouse had recently had an accident. And the difference was that the insurers set rates based on the zip code, and they had decided that Otis' the zip code um, was that the base rate was $753 a year. Otis's neighborhood and the uh, white neighborhood, but when you looked at the underlying paths that the insurers had paid for those neighborhoods, that wasn't a true reflection of risk. Right? The payouts in these fields were less than they were in Rick Park. And so this was an example of an algorithm where bias was in this setting of the base rates. And so um, that was just a highlight. I hope it wasn't too um, with the remote, but thank you. Thanks, Julia. And the first question coming to my mind is, have these biases been corrected since the, you pointed them out? And who should correct them? You know, because we always say, and this panel also say, uh, we should hold algorithms to account. But in, in the end, the algorithms are not responsible of anything, you know, those who write them are responsible for, for what they do. So who's to be held to account for these? 
That's a really good question. I think um, we're st like still as a society working out how we're going to hold these types of systems accountable. Um, in the criminal risk score case, um, there hasn't been much change. Um, most of the places that use that risk score are still using it, as far as I know. But there's been a lot of discussion in the um, computer science community about um, how to build a better risk score and lots of efforts on the way to improve on the one that we utilize. So I think there may be change in the long run, but it hasn't happened yet. In terms of the car insurance, California state regulators did take our analysis and they have asked several insurers to adjust their rates and they found that the flaws that we saw were correct. But that was only one state. Um, the other state we looked at have not done it yet. Wow. Looks like a long struggle there. <laughs> yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so the, the question is, I know that there is this big debate around ethics and AI in the, in the computer science community. I myself intervened in a, in a computer science event last year and, and talked about ethics and AI. And, and they were all fascinated by this perspective of bringing ethics and philosophy into their profession. And they were, and they were really collaborative. They wanted to do something about it. But the question is, how do you reconcile these things? You know, what, 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 what a fair algorithm looks like? Because we don't really know. I don't, I, my, my, my issue being that, you know, we may, we may be trying to, to solve some things that are really difficult and have been asked for centuries right now by philosophy. And we, we want algorithms to, to be able to solve that. You know, even a fair algorithm sounds, it means you, you know what fairness is in the first place. So, to me at least. So, yeah. how do you reconcile these big, you know, problems that, that we have, like this actual problem of discri uh, automatic discrimination and the fact that to solve it, you need to actually t bring philosophy into the, into the scenario? Yeah, I mean, the debate about the criminal risk scores, um, in the end, after we published, really just became a philosophical debate because, um, as I mentioned, the score is 60% accurate um, for both black and white defendants. So mm -hmm. the makers of the score said that's what they think fairness is. It's equally accurate mm -hmm. for both black and white defendants. And we said, look, that's true, but the 40% of the time that it's wrong, it's wrong in completely different ways, right? So blacks are twice likely to get an unjustifiably score and whites are twice likely you get an unjustifiably low score. Mm. And they said, well, that's just not our definition of fairness. And so it's really a debate about what does fairness mean. And I agree that that is what the whole debate that's raging forever. But I think we have an opportunity now as we to encode our implicit and explicit biases into automated decision making that we could actually um, re-examine what we have considered fair and decide whether it still holds up, especially now that we can measure the impact on humans, right? Like, so maybe it seems fair just from after when we have it accurate to keep it at the time black and white defense. So when you see the true stories of these people like Jen, and maybe it doesn't look as fair now that we have new data I see. It's, uh, it, at times, it's a bit difficult to follow because of the Is uh, it? Uh, the connection. So I just I just ask you if you could like speak very <laughs> very clearly because it's, at times you know the connection is not exactly perfect. So you can miss you can miss some blips uh, sometimes. But anyway, I got it. And um, I think there is also this. The, the other problem is that how how many ways there are so many ways in which these algorithms can automatically discriminate and and produce injustice as you as you argue you have e scores in credit systems and financial systems you have like predictive scores of, of all sorts in health you know on in the workplace uh, you, you, they used to predict uh, information consumption patterns. And now I found, like today, reading on The Intercept, that they have, uh, Facebook is offering to its advertisers an AI system to, to actually predict the way in which they change 
they are there are people that are about to change their consumption behavior maybe switching from uh from one type of coffee to another to one car maker to the other and i was wondering what what will happen if this is applied to to politics basically you know can you imagine like political micro targeting based on you know predictions made by ai on who's about to switch from a political party to another for example so you that would be like kind of predictive uh, um, <laughs> micro targeting even even worse than what we've seen with Cambridge Analytica but the issue out there is basically the same so we, we don't really know how many ways there are in which our data are treated and we don't really know who's doing that and we, we don't really know who's holding them to account if something goes wrong so my question is do you see the similarity between like these this Cambridge Analytica thing that's going on in the last week and and what you did in the last years uh yeah i think you're right there's a lot of similarity you know Cambridge analytica basically promised that it understood your psychological visit and it would allow political groups to target you based on knowing what kind of psychological habits you have yeah it's not clear that they succeeded at that but Obviously, somebody will, right? And that is really worrying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's worrying, and uh, especially in perspective, because for what I got, the, these micro targeting micro targeting techniques are not that good right now. They're not that effective right now, as at least at, from what we know. Thing is that we they can they can become really effective probably in the future and I don't know what what do you think about this uh, Zuckerberg testimony especially when he said all problems are going to be sorted out by AI in the long term especially hate speech I I'm, I'm thinking of the Rohingya case for example he, he said in an, in a New York Times interview he said uh, we have a system an automated system in place to actually prevent hate speech from being published in the first place. And then yeah. the the activists said, "No, we are the system <laughs> because you have none." <laughs> yeah, and that that's kind of scary to me, you know. So, what 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 do you think of this idea of of solving these problems through AI? Yeah, I mean, he talked about AI so much in his testimony, and it's really interesting because when you talk to Facebook, when I talk to Facebook executives about. Um, hate speech, for instance, I've done a lot of reporting on that in the yeah. past year. Um, the first thing they say is, this is not going to be solved by AI, <laughs> right? So yeah. um, obviously there must be some disconnect within Facebook because um, hate speech is just like incredibly context specific, right? So something might be considered hate speech in one context and then not in another even within a country right it could be different in different regions yeah, of the country absolutely. and so you know if you think about where ai is right now most people's experience of it is sort of be through the google maps right like telling you where to go and how often are those right i'd say like you know 75 percent of the time maybe but that's a really simple problem like with which route do I go on certain lines, you know? So I don't think AI is where near being able to solve those kinds of problems with human um, hatred. Yeah, and there's also this, he also found, um, you found contradiction in what Facebook said, like in, uh, in discrimination in ad categories, for example, I remember. And, and, and yet, uh, Zuckerberg said in, in his testimony the, op the, the exact opposite. I, I think about the rent and rental housing ads you, you, uh, case you highlighted in which you found out that, that for example, certain categories of users were excluded like, uh, from, some, from having some ad advertising on, on rental housing and on, on a specific basis and, and, and it was, and was against the law in the U.S., I guess, for what, for what you, were, for what you wrote. And, and Zuckerberg said, this is not going to happen anymore. We are a system put in place to prevent, you know, for example, to target uh, advertising to Jew haters, to the SS lovers or things like that. And, and what you found out, uh, otherwise, and you found out otherwise when you, when you go, went to check, did you, are you planning to check more on these? Because, because he's quite, you know, he's, he's promising quite a lot. Yeah, we have checked. So what happened is we first bought an ad 
um, I guess it was about a year, a little over a year ago, we yeah. bought an ad for housing that it, it offers, um, Facebook offers advertisers a way to exclude people from seeing your ad. So they have a little menu, a drop down menu, and it says like, exclude these audiences. And so what we did was we chose to exclude African Americans, Hispanics, and Asian Americans just to see if we could get a housing ad through in that context. And it was approved right away. And um, so we wrote a story about how Facebook was allowing this. And that was um, like November of 2016. So then last year in February, uh, Facebook said, oh, we fixed it. We built this big AI system. It's never going to happen. <laughs> um, we can automatically detect these types of things. Yeah. But then in August or September, I guess, I got a tip that it was still um, possible. And so we went and bought ads and we bought the same ad a year later um, and it went through. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know what that big system was that they had. Um, it's like the Rohingya but, one. Yeah. It's like the Rohingya system, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, um, and then we called them and they said, oh my gosh, we're so sorry, blah, blah, blah. And so they decided to do what I thought they should have done from the beginning, which was they said, maybe we shouldn't have this little drop down menu that says exclude black people. <laughs> so now they've gotten rid of that menu. But of course you could still exclude all sorts of other things. Like you could pick a zip code to exclude, right? So you could exclude yeah. the so it's, and have black it's people. It's the same, yeah. The same, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But do you expect the tech companies to be more open and collaborative when it comes to sharing data or algorithmic transparency after all this? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't think they have any incentive unless they're forced to, right? I mean, I, I just don't see any reason why they would app, open themselves up for public scrutiny yeah. unless the government requires them to. Yeah. And then the problems come uh, what, to, what to really actually ask them when, you, when it comes to algorithmic transparency. I, I once talked to, to some guys from former Facebook uh, guy, Antonio Garcia Martinez, he told me when I interviewed him, uh, even if he, Facebook opens up the whole of the algorithm, it's going to be pointless for, for, for normal people, for persons, and for, for, the, for the lawmakers because it's going to be so complicated and so, you know, so long and everything that nobody will actually make any use of it. I don't know if it's true or not, but, but surely there is a problem there of trying to balance, you know, the protection of their intellectual property and at the other, uh, on the other, on the other side, you need to do something that is making, that is giving us valuable information that everybody can recognize or that at least lawmakers and, and pundits can recognize. So what, what, what's you, what do you think it would be right to ask of them in terms of data to be, to be shared and transparency to be given? That's a great question because, um, um, you know, Martinez is right that the algorithms themselves are yeah. often very hard to um, understand. And I think that the companies also have a pretty compelling argument that those algorithms are their trade secrets. Yeah. However, what I do think is that you can audit the outcomes of this algorithm. So just like we did, looked at the scores that were produced by the Compass software. You don't have software, right? You don't know what it is doing. Mm -hmm. But we do look at what it, decisions it made and then compare that to the reality of whether those people went on to commit crimes. So I believe that the way to look at these algorithms is to look at what decisions they're making and audit those decisions. Are they making the right decisions? Mm -hmm. Are the decisions they make fair? And you need to see the algorithm to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's, it's going to be tough and it's going to involve a lot of effort, but it can be done. And I see a lot of people in, the acad in, academia, in academia uh, all over the world, and especially in the U.S., there, there are many, many research centers being born right in the last, I think, in the last year or so um, around these topics. I remember an op-ed by Kathy O'Neill 
saying we're not doing enough. On I think it was on the New York Times or something. We're not doing enough. There, we're not studying enough. The academia is not concentrated enough on this problem. And then I got from the replies on her Twitter, on her tweet, uh, uh, that actually a lot of researchers came and said, no, actually I have a research center doing this in, in this place, in this country. We're creating this initiative. So I think it's going to be... It's going to be an, a crowded sector in a while, and I think it's a good thing. Um, but it, the other thing that I was fascinated in, about in your work is like the the way in which you treated the the, the dark ads um, uh, topic. Like this, for those who don't know, dark ads are so called. Dark ads are just basically political ads um, that are targeted to some people and therefore are not shown to all the others, and, and therefore they're in the dark of these of these ads, and ProPublica built this, this tool of the political ad collector pack that we use in Italy too. Uh, friends at Open Polis may used it to actually check what went on during the electoral campaign in 2018, like last month, three months ago. And uh, it was pretty, a pretty interesting way of getting around you know, the, the limitations in, in data sharing in, from Facebook and, and from other companies in other cases. So uh, I'm, I was wondering whether you got a sense of uh, what you understood of how political micro-targeting is actually used because uh, the pack has been used, I, from what I got, uh, in eight different countries, correct? Uh, maybe more, I think, maybe at this point. More. More than 12, I think, yeah. Did you, did, did you have a chance to, to, to go through the results or have a comparative view of what happened in the different countries just to know whether, you know, all countries are on the same track or at the same, are the same level of sophistication? Because for what I got, I, I'm, I did a research study in the last six months myself with a, with a research project, project called, called Punto Zero, and we, we made use, we, we, we inter actually interviewed people from all political parties and what they said is that basically, I don't know if it, that's true, but it's appear, it appears to be confirmed by what Open Polis found, is that they, there is no real sophistication in this, in this effort, and in some political parties there is no effort at all at trying to, to micro-target uh, ads. So do you get a sense of what, 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 what is going on, on on a world scale, on an international level? Uh, yeah, we noticed a lot of differences. So. Um, some countries, like we started in Germany, and we found that in Germany, you know, there wasn't a lot of activity. I think partly because their campaign season is really restricted to six weeks, and um, and so it was just uh, less than we saw in other places. But then in Australia, um, they found all sorts of sort of misleading ads and people who are definitely trying to uh, sway things through um some micro targeting so we notice like different things happening in different countries one thing i would say the, about it is that we don't know how much targeting is really happening. so facebook puts in the ad the reason you saw this ad is because this advertiser wanted to reach somebody aged 18 to 25 in your country. Yeah. But we don't know if that's everything the advertiser asked for because you know there's this drop down menu like I want to target to people who you know have these views or whatever. And we don't know if Facebook is telling us everything about what micro targeting is used in each ad. Yeah. Yeah we, we you mean that, uh, for example, with your tool, you don't get all the data you need to un actually understand wh what kind of micro-targeting was going on, even, even in, the, in the ads you collected? I mean, even worse than that, we don't know if we have all the data, right? Because they tell oh, you something. I see. I see Facebook point. tells you something, but it doesn't... It, there are studies that show that that's not everything. And so yeah. we just don't know um, if our ads that we're seeing are are actually showing how much micro-targeting is going on. Yeah, do you think these uh, self-regulatory measures that Facebook announced will solve this problem or not? Uh, probably not. Um, they started rolling out this new ad transparency project in Canada and we looked at it there. Huh. And huh. it's um, 
it's not that helpful. They basically require advertisers to post the ads they are running on their Facebook ad page. But I guess that would mean for a regular person or even for a journalist, you would have to visit every possible advertiser's page, Facebook page every day to see if there are new ads. And um, a lot of these advertisers are not, um, you know, who you think they are, right? So you wouldn't even know to look for their pages um, because they just pop up and start advertising for some campaign or something. So, and also Facebook doesn't let you um, scrape data from their website. Um, so I'm worried that researchers won't be able to collect those ads, even if they go look at them on a Facebook page, how will they download them to analyze them? And that's that's a, the bigger problem here is that probably what, what Facebook announced is really similar to the kind of legislation that the U.S. has in mind. I think the Honest Ads Act that's being proposed is pretty similar yeah. to what Facebook wants to do. So my question is, is, the, is even legislation going to be pointless? Well, they're trying really hard to make Congress feel like legislation is pointless. Um, that, I think that's the goal of that effort is to... Um, self-regulate in in the hopes of deterring regulation uh so and i think congress the the honest ad act does not appear to be going anywhere so it doesn't look like it's going to pass it's not it's not okay so not even after that after the testimony after the scandal or, or no no i don't think so <laughs> so it just, was just a show off just like bringing the powerful to account in front of tv yeah. Oh, nice. I wasted Sorry. 10 hours of my life then. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I'm not the only one, I think, in, in this room. But uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's going to be like that too. I, what my, since we're at a journalism festival, you know, I, I just was fascinated and scared by what you had to do uh, to actually gain some insights into these topics. Uh, I mean, like, it's the crowd, the, the, the pack tool is amazing and everything, and we have other instances around the world, you know, the we target tool and the other, and other tools, uh, Facebook tracking exposed, and many others. But I, I'm, my question is, how is it possible that we as journalists are, are forced to resort to such tools and not have any kind of, you know, other way to to get direct data, to get primary sources, to, to, to do our job. We need, we need to build tools to actually try and get a, a, statist a statistically probably not relevant you know, flavor of what's going on, on on the biggest platform in the world. It doesn't sound right to me. Mm. That's interesting. I, I think of it as a great opportunity. Um, you know, if you're a banking reporter uh, and you cover banks, you know, you don't really have it any opportunity to do anything to investigate the banks directly, right? You have to rely on whatever they statements they give to the regulators or um, to their investors. Um, and you can't really test, you know, to see directly, are they giving mortgages only to white people or whatever? So I guess I think that being a tech reporter, um, and being able to use technology, technological tools is a great advantage, right? We can hold these companies to account in ways that other industries, it's much harder to get visibility into. So I guess I see it the opposite way, which is this is a great opportunity to, um, to really uh, be even more forceful watchdogs. I see. And, and the way in which you work enables, involves a lot of things. For example, I think without the FOIA request, it would have been much difficult. So, for example, a FOIA legislation is a good starting point for, for journalists. I, I know that in Italy has been a big, a big and huge debate. We had some law. And, but in many countries, it's still a problem, I think. So you need, you need some kind of good legislation to, to get the data and that you get some, you know, good, a good uh, investment to, to actually, and good technology to actually try and, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and monitor all this, all this data. So I think it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty tough journalism and, and I, I think it's, you did a great job. So it's, uh, it, it's also a model that can be replicated, you know, so that's, that's interesting to me that I hope that more 
uh, more people are going to try and, and solve these problems by these ways, even though technology to me is not enough. You know, I just, I just would like to have a kind of an environment in which some, these platforms are somehow obliged to, to be more transparent, for example, on these on, on, on micro-targeting, for example. I don't know. I, I read any kind of, of thing in, in, uh, in the last days and after this scandal. Somebody wanted even to ban micro-targeting or something. Um, right. Somebody wanted Facebook uh, governed by a UN body. Um, really, actually, David Kirkpatrick. Uh, and some, some others uh, said we're going to break the monopolies and everything. So what, is, what do you think is the best solution to get some some useful transparency out of these companies? Mm. I'm not really good with solutions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, I proposed a few small solutions in a recent article where I said there's four things you could do to fix yeah. Facebook. Um, but they're very like low hanging fruit, right? There's things like in the US, and I think actually this is probably true in Europe too, there are no fines for data breaches. So when they lost all that data from Cambridge Analytica, they don't have to pay a fine the way that a company would pay a fine for an oil spill or some other breach. So that's one thing that's pretty simple and that would probably make them take care of our data better. Yeah. Um, another thing is there's, um, in terms of election advertising and interference from foreign governments, like the Russian interference in the U.S., um, there is a similar model to what um, banking does. They have um, requirements to know their customer. So they have to know about the people who have bank accounts. And then there's regulators and who um, examine suspicious accounts. So the bank will bring them a whole bunch of suspicious accounts and say, we don't know who these people are. Can you look into it? And um, that gives the bank immunity if those accounts are bad, they don't get liable for it. So they have an incentive to bring a lot of accounts to those investigators. And so a similar model has been proposed for um, election advertising that the um, Facebook should have a know your customer rule and they should also bring suspicious accounts to some sort of investigative office. Um, so that could be a a pretty reasonable solution. And then there's two other things, which is one, um, you know, there's been long been a call for ethics boards to oversee any type of human experimentation on these platforms. So what Cambridge Analytica was doing was basically human experimentation um, without any ethics review. So it seems like there should be some sort of independent ethics review for that. And then finally on hate speech, which is the most complicated issue, um, one thing that is um, being challenged now in the U.S. is the fact that the, the tech companies have immunity from liability for any content on their platform. So that means they don't have um, any sense of urgency about cleaning up hate speech because they're never going to be sued for it. They're not going to be held to account. And Congress is just starting to consider whether maybe they're going to pull back some of that um, immunity. I think this thing of the ethics board you mentioned is, uh, I think it came up in the, fir uh, the first time it came up, uh, it was when, he, when, they, when we found out about the, the human experimentation with, with Facebook feeds, when, when Facebook was, uh, was meddling with the, was, was inserting deliberately like positive and negative content to see the reaction in, in people experiencing a, a, a greater degree of positive content. And that was highly questionable. And, and of course, you know, the, the issue there being, to me, is also a point of informed consent. You know, so we, are, the, are users given consent to, not only to, to giving data to third parties or data of their friends, for example, but are they given their consent to be experimental subjects when they just, when they subscribe to social network? That's a big issue to me in research right now. And I think, I think that has to do also with can, the kind of experimentation that Facebook deliberately did to, to write papers about it, to do research about it, to just oh, we, no, and not speak about the fact that they, of course, try to maximize engagement through it so, and, and then profit. And so to me, that, that's a very, that, it's a very sensitive question and, and also one that has been more actual now than ever because one of the the, the sidebacks we have on of the Cambridge Analytica thing is that maybe researchers will have less access to data 
they need right now. So um, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about this whole thing, but I think this is going to be bad and not, not great for research and for people. I don't know if you agree on that, but... Um, the ethics review board will be bad or the lack of ethics review boards is bad? Uh, no, I mean like the fact that we're going to have like less access to data because, you know, they will have to try and stop this data spread and they call it data yeah. breach, yeah. Yeah, no, the, the tech companies are going to use the excuse of data breaches and Cambridge Analytica to even further limit academic and journalist access, I think. That's already happening. Absolutely not, not what we expected, <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I, I, since we'll have like 25 more minutes, something like that, I would like to hear from you and if you're still awake, uh, there are questions, one here in front, is there a microphone somewhere? Uh, thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, thanks so much for this talk. It's super fascinating. I love the work you guys are doing. Um, my name's Karis. I'm a freelancer as well as a journalism student. And uh, so we talked a little bit in this panel about how difficult it is to actually um, keep perhaps the algorithms themselves accountable because there's not much transparency. Um, with companies, there's no incentive to be transparent, but I wonder about the other side of that, sort of regulations that improve the rights of consumers. So for example, the upcoming EU GDPR Act that will allow people to actually have control over what data um, is put into sort of automation algorithms and artificial intelligence, um, and even in the US with the Illinois um, Biometric Information Privacy Act, which has allowed people to actually sue Facebook over using facial recognition. You know, do you see regulation over um, data privacy to be perhaps helpful in also uh, preventing what algorithms can do in terms of bias? Yeah, I'm hopeful about the GDPR in particular because it um, really gives um, EU citizens a lot more access to their data. And I think we need that right now because we're in the diagnosis period where we don't know actually which algorithms are bad and which aren't. And what we need is more data, right, to understand what is happening. And so um, if we can get a bunch of data through using the GDPR's open access requirements, maybe we'll learn a little bit more about where the problems lie. You know, it, it takes a long time for these things to become um, revealed. You know, it took us two years, right, to basically sort of show Facebook how um, their housing, you know, they were allowing all this discrimination in housing. And it was only because we just kept buying ads, right? And I think that like enormous net amounts of those types of things need to happen in order to figure out where the problems are so that then we can start to solve them. More questions? No question? Okay, I'll, I'll go with an, another one in the meantime. Um, I, I think uh, I'm rereading your uh, hate speech investigation on Facebook. Um, what struck me the most was like a kind of, I don't know how to call it, basically a philosophical maybe stance that's behind all of that. That Facebook, contrary to, to US law, you're right, is unlike American law, uh, you, you, I quote you, which permits preferences such as affirmative action for rational minorities and women for the sake of diversity or redress and discrimination, Facebook's algorithm is designed to defend all races, all races and genders equally. And that's, that's striking to me, that it's, how is it possible that this it's, is allowed? If, if, if the law says otherwise, what, what comes first, the law or the policy? Right, well, this is the crazy thing about Facebook, right? As a multinational company, and this is true for Google and Twitter also, um, and who they set their own laws in some ways, right? They just decide what they want um, hate speech to be, and it, it sort of resembles a little bit like the law in the U.S., or maybe it resembles a little bit of the U European law, but it doesn't, it's their own creation, and they just have a couple guys in their law, you know, legal office write it up, and um, 
And then it's like the way that governs all speech around the world. And so it's a really um, crazy situation and one that I think that's why it requires us as journalists to investigate and to make it transparent because um, we should know what those laws are, right? At least in our government, even if we don't like them, we supposedly elected them or we know what laws they're passing. But with Facebook, these hate speech rules that I wrote about were secret until we published them. We obtained documents and, and published them, and otherwise nobody even knew what they were. What kind of response, what kind of response do you have from Facebook after these? Um, well, when we wrote the initial story on hate speech, we pointed out one very strange um, thing, which was that um, they had rules that protected um, gender and race, um, but not age. And age is usually also a protected characteristic in in some hate speech, you know, in other kinds of civil rights laws. So um, what that meant was that they had a slide that they showed to their um, people they were training and they would say, um, which of these groups is protected against hate speech? Black um, children, white men, or female drivers? And the correct answer was white men, um, which was shocking to a lot of people because black children, um, race, black is protected, but children are not. So. Um, after our story happened, they added age so that um, children would also be a protected category. Um, but once again, that doesn't really solve the overall problem, which is that white men are still getting enormous protections, right? And um, and it, any and they have a special thing about like Muslim um, people or immigrants are only given like quasi protected status for some reason, which is like not the same as like, um, Muslims. So refugees and immigrants in Europe, um, have some lower status. So they have all sorts of rules about who gets protected and who doesn't. And really what they responded to was just the one part that was the most egregious, which was the, the fact that they weren't, um, considering black children to be protected. Uh, and also the fact and the problem that you that you found is that these policies, questionable or not, were not even respected by themselves, and <laughs> like making like they, they actually admitted that they they made the wrong call, like the reviewers made the the wrong calls on 22 cases out of 49, something like that. If wow. Yeah, it's it's really striking to me again, and I don't know. It, it, do you think this this thing that they they're um, um, hiring like double, like 20,000 people like to review content. Would, would this make a difference? Is it a problem of how many people are there reviewing content or is, or is more to it? I don't know. I think it's more than just the people problem. Um, the rules themselves are so complicated. Like I spent months studying them and I still don't quite understand them because there's a million different cases like, huh. um, you have to look under like the bullying section and then there's five different types of bullying. And then you look in the hate speech section and maybe those two rules actually contradict each other. And it's, so it's like um, the rule book is like hundreds of pages and incredibly complicated. And you, I feel like you would need like a law degree to really understand it. And so I just don't, and then they're hiring people in other countries with at low wages um, for like hourly rates and, um, and you have a I just don't know that those people. <laughs> and you have a couple of seconds to make the decision. Still a second to make a decision. So yeah. I'm just not sure that that's the right way to approach that. Yeah, but I don't even know alternatives. That's my my problem. You know, when it comes to monitoring speech, um, the solution, and of course. They, the many politicians, even in Italy, uh, they, they ask for immediate takedown from not contents not even showing up. So, of course, you know, when you, you pass laws like the one in Germany, for example, on illicit content, and my sense is that, that the platforms are going to respond with, with preemptive filtering, basically, which is the, the easiest way for them to avoid any kind of legal liability and millions of fines for each content that is uploaded on the platform. So um, what I'm really scared of is that, you know, in this quest for perfection, you know, of, of speech on, on the platforms, the result is gonna be like censored, like Russia or China-like environment on social media. Do you think this is like 
a possibility for the democratic countries that we're heading towards like this kind of automation of censorship and this kind of authoritarian fashion. Yeah, I think we are. I mean, there's really no question that we're moving that direction. Germany is the beginning, um, but uh, across Europe, is there's a hate speech um, law that went into effect, I think, a year or two ago where um, they're asking the tech companies to uh, take things down faster and monitoring how quickly that happens. Um, even in the U S there's now a movement towards, um, more and more concerns about taking down things. We just, I think passed a law on, on sex trafficking content has to be taken down. So we're definitely moving towards sort of automated censorship and, you know, Facebook's great dream in life is to, you know, get this all done through AI. I don't think they're achieving that dream right now, but they will, get there as soon as they can because it's great for their profit margins. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's really, um, concerning because obviously censorship might start off with a good, um, intent, right? Nobody's for sex, sex trafficking, but, um, but it, it often leads to, um, really bad outcomes and political repression. Italy, I don't know. I don't know if you're aware of that, but in Italy, the law enforcement on the website, they, they put up a red button in which you, its users could like um, signal uh, fake news or false news or, uh, I don't know, malicious information of any sort. And the law enforcement itself would fact check it, which is kind of crazy, you know, police guys fact checking news on social media and actually taking the content down for a while. So I, I know the Corriere wrote that they took down or they blocked and, and it was quoted in in commas, and I don't know why, but uh, they blocked 170 pieces of content. I don't know what it even mean. Does it even mean? Uh, but in the end, the David Kay, the special rapporteur for the UN on freedom of expression, had to intervene and say, "Okay, this is crazy. You need to get rid of it immediately and substitute it with something else." And the page went basically offline with no explanation. With, we don't know what happened. We don't know what they did. We have no idea where this blocked information went. And that's how it, you know, that's the result of the fake news uh, debate in Italy. You know, law enforcement becoming fact checkers for the sake of the <coughs> nation. You know, and it's kind of scary to me. I, I don't know if you have other instances about this in the world, but I, I've seen like Malaysia going to jail people for six years you know, for just sp spreading correct, incorrect information. We have Russia yesterday passing in the Duma, you know, our first reading of a law that would, of course, you know, take down any content and jail everybody basically for <laughs> just because they want to and they can. And, and so, and again, it's this fake news rhetoric, you know, it has backfired spectacularly, I guess. I don't know what's your opinion on this, but I think we have to be careful with our words when we discuss these things. and. We've been very reckless, I think, in the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard, right? You don't want to... Anything can be twisted. And so it. we also, as journalists, don't want to censor ourselves from not saying fake news just because it then was used against us, right? But, um, but it is really... I agree with you that it has um, given... All sorts of governments have taken that and run with it, including, you know, the U.S. Uh, president who loves to call any criticism of himself fake news. Um, so, but that said, you know, we as journalists have an obligation to call out things that are fake, right, and not true. So we can't limit ourselves from that, too. So it, even though, even though the governments are, are not acting correctly, we, we should also still remember that our job is to speak truth always. Absolutely, absolutely. Is there any additional question before we close? I, I don't know. We scared you off with this. <laughs> there is another question from the, from the front. 
Hi, uh, it's me again. Um, I was actually just wanted to go back to something you mentioned about um, one p possible solution is to um, perhaps not open up the algorithms within the companies but do external auditing. Do you know if anyone is doing that right now? I mean, aside from ProPublica, <laughs> apparently, um, you know, whether it's uh, advocacy groups who are offering this to tech companies or tech companies who are trying to self-audit in order to uh, fix some of these problems? Because I imagine for tech companies, I mean, Facebook being the obvious example right now, they see it's it's really bad PR, you know, to have a biased algorithm, I think, in a lot of cases. So do you see examples of, of that solution um, actually happening right now? Um, as much as I would have liked, um, Facebook, for instance, said to me um, that they are always auditing their um, uh, those content moderators who who take down content, um, who are looking at hate speech. But when we brought them an example of 50 different um, hate speech decisions they had made, and they had made the wrong call in almost half of them. Um, and I said, how did this you know, get through your filters? And they were like, well, we don't know, but no, we have a really low error rate normally. But of course, you just found like this exceptional um, situation. Well, the problem is with an audit that they do internally that's never shown to anyone, you know, who knows what they're finding in it. But certainly when we do an audit externally, we find that it doesn't look like their quality control is very good. Um, so, and I think that's true for all these companies. They all say that they have internal audits and they're constantly checking on things. But, you know, when things come to light in the public, it becomes clear that they aren't, right? Remember when... Um, Google was tagging images of black people as gorillas um, because they didn't have enough black faces in their original training data. Um, and that is um, something that if you were really serious about auditing, you would at the very least check to see what kind of um, names you're putting on people's faces. So it doesn't seem like they're doing that much, I guess. Yes, and, and one final question for me, if there is anybody else, is, you know, we're a journalism festival, and I would like to ask you, what kind of com competencies, what kind of core competencies would we, you have to build as a journalist to actually investigate these kind of topics? What do you think it, you need the most to actually do this job right? Yeah. Um, yeah, people always think that, you know, um, that you have to be like a data scientist or you have to be a computer programmer. And it's actually, I don't think that's always true. Um, the programmers that I work with, Jeff Larson, who I think is in the room with you guys, um, I think he studied English in college and then just taught himself um, computer programming and technical skills. Um, our other two um, programmers, Surya Matu and Madeline Varner, both studied art um, and artists. And so I think that technical skills that um, can be self-taught. And so I would encourage journalists to um, just make yourself a little bit more tech literate, you know, learn how to use SQL, for instance. That's probably we do most of our data analysis in SQL. Um, learn how to do some simple technical things like scraping the web. And they're not that hard. You can take a class at NICAR or one of the data journalism conferences um, and start doing a, a little bit of this type of work. Thanks. Questions? We have no. So I think we're, I'm out of questions myself. So uh, thanks for being here. And thanks, Julia. And uh, I hope to see you again sometime. Thank you.